Honkai Star Rail is a great game. I played it longer than I care to admit and I still do. Same thing with Honkai Impact 3rd. However, there was this feeling nagging at me while I was reading through the countless lines of dialogue and listening to the great voice acting of Star Rail that made me lose connection with the game, if you know what I mean. It's like that feeling when you're waiting for something to happen and it never actually happens. So, a funny little thing about me. I've been playing Honkai Impact 3rd on and off since 2019. The story of that game always kept me hooked, waiting for the next twist, for the next event. You go online and see people talking about the future events that you haven't experienced yet, and you go like, oh boy, can't wait to reach that part and join the hype. For Honkai Star Rail, I was waiting for the hype to come. The starting act or the tutorial was very strong. Kafka, Silver Wolf, the Hertha Station staff, the Astral Express team, all great characters. Even though some of them could use more fleshing out, they're majorly well done. We drive away the doomsday beast and Welt arrives, we depart on the trailblazing path with a very beautiful track playing in the background, and then Billabog starts. We land, leaving the Giga Chad belt behind because we all know he being with us would make this too easy. We meet Sampo, who to this day I have absolutely no idea who or what he's working for. They claimed he worked with Wildfire, but I highly doubt that fourth wall breaking son of a gun is just that. We go into the city and are directed to meet Kokolia, the supreme Kokomandant or something, I don't know. She calls the shots around these parts and I'd imagine she would want to know that there is a nuclear warhead leaking the radiation on her planet so hard it's, it's caused climate change. For those of you who don't know, Kokolia is also a character in the Honkai Impact 3rd universe. She appears in multiple mangas, events, and plays a major role in the main story as one of the early villains. So I immediately knew that this Kokolia in Honkai Star Rail was up to something uncanny, even before they showed us the creepy conversation with the radiation ghosts or whatever. We go to this hotel, and on our way, we see Bronia, another reoccurring character from Honkai Impact 3rd. This time, she's the protagonist of the game. Bronia, Mei, and Kiana are the trio, or the main trio of the game. So, the build-up was definitely there. The hype was at its peak. The next day, we are immediately confronted and become wanted by Kokolia because apparently, we're invaders, or something along those lines. And the guards, led by Bronia, chases around the closed parts of the town. We are cornered and had to be saved by Sampo, who then takes us, and Bronia, to the underworld, a city under the city. Apparently, the way between the two locations was closed off for years because of the eternal freeze and the fragmentum monsters that leak into the underworld. So two different cities which used to coexist suddenly cut off their communications with the overworld city locking the underworld citizens underground. I can already see hundreds of wonderful ways this can go. The OST in the underworld is fucking phenomenal. Gotta love my video game music especially Hoyoverse music. The structure of the city is nice too and feels natural, like actual people do live there. When we wake up, the first character we see is Sampo talking to Natasha, yet another recurring character from Honkai Impact 3rd. Natasha is a medic and has or had an orphanage, which is a similar thing to the Natasha from Honkai Impact. The orphanage part, not the medic part. Raven was a bar owner instead. In any case, Natasha nurses us back to health, and we go out, meet our companions, and go look for the leader of the underworld for support in our mission to recover the nuclear warhead before it's too late. We see Bronia getting mugged by some unnamed NPCs who, I shit you not, takes out a gun and shoots her. Didn't know we were in America. Luckily for her, a certain blue-haired, beautifully designed, scythe-wielding young lady tore a hole in the space-time continuum and destroyed the bullet midair. Meet Sally. She's special, I guess. It's never explained how she can teleport around like that, but if I talk about this, I gotta do it for all the characters. How the fuck is March able to create ice out of thin air? And Dan Hung able to do Dan Hung things? What kind of power system is used here? In Honkai Impact 3rd, we're told that Valkyries use Honkai energy or basically modified imaginary energy to power their battlesuits, which give them their powers. But, uh, 
but we're never explicitly told about how apparently everyone and their mothers has magic in this game. I guess you can argue that paths exist and it's what gives them their powers, but that seems so random to me because Sele doesn't follow Lan, the Aeon of the Hunts. She probably never even heard of the guy. What about Hook then? Why, why can she get away with having a massive claw machine that can reduce a human to mincemeat in mere seconds? Marsh doesn't follow preservation, because we're trailblazers, so we should be following the path of the nameless. So, we can clearly rule out that paths aren't exactly what gives the characters their powers. Then, what does, game? Anyways, back to Sally. She's another re recurring character from Honkai Impact 3rd. In that game, Sally and Bronia went to the same orphanage, which was overseen by Kokolia. Bronia was to be experimented upon, and uh, Sele couldn't let that pass, so she took the experiment herself, causing her powers to go rampant until she was defeated and absorbed into a different dimension, where she got trapped for years. One thing that I admire about Honkai star rail Sele is that her design was inspired by Honkai Gakuen's adult Sele design, which is gorgeous. Anyways, we go on, meet and beat up a few machines, then meet. <laughs> Yeah, this is Farag and Clara, and to say that this reminds me of something would be an understatement. Big robots fight, when we're done, they've already left. Anyways, we go meet Chief Oleg, he's the leader of Wildfire, who then asks us to do stuff I guess. At this point, the story slowly started to lose me clearly because I literally can't remember what he asked us to do, but we do it. We also learned that Svarog was some kind of robot overlord who doesn't really like wildfire all that much. Anyways, we go to sleep, but we can't so we take a walk outside, meet Bronia, chat for a bit, see how bland her character really is the moment she starts to speak, though I can't blame her due to her backstory. Then we overhear Natasha asking Sele to go fetch some medical supplies from the infested part of town. We naturally decide to tag along. A few small fights in the corrupted zone and we meet a child who apparently was trying to scavenge for his sick parents. Sele tries to use the best way of dealing with children, but Bronia steps up and defuses the situation. Anyways, we got some supplies and decided to delve deeper to get more. We reach the orphanage that once belonged to Natasha and surprise surprise, Bronia remembers this place from her childhood. Turns out Bronia and Sele grew up in the same orphanage until Kokoria adopted Bronia and took her up to the overworld. Sounds familiar? Anyways, we get our supplies and start heading back before we meet. <laughs> this time, she's with some other smaller robot who doesn't instantly throw missiles at us, so we have a small chat. Turns out, she's also here for supplies, because the other faction is also badly damaged from the corruption and the infighting of the underworlders. Bottom line, we split the loot and leave. We give Natasha her stuff, then we are informed that if anyone knows anything about the Stellaron, then it's gotta be Svarog. He's pretty old, and his database gotta have something. We make the trip to see And after some mingling with the locals, we gain access to their mansion, where we convince Clara to allow us to speak to Svarog. We have a nice chat with him, where he very nicely throws a barrage of missiles at us. Thankfully, we have a baseball bat, and you know, for Hoyoverse, a baseball bat is much better than missiles. Anyways, we wreck the washing machine, and he finally tells us that the Stellaron was in possession of the architects of the overworld, and they tried to destroy it but couldn't. So instead of putting it in a rocket and throwing it to space, they decided to keep it around for funsies. In any case, Bronia gets to know that Kakolia isn't really the all-knowing god that she's actually keeping the Stellaron away from us. She almost has a breakdown from it until Sele gives her a slap in the ass and tells her to shut the fuck up and stop crying like a baby. We go back, sleep, find out that Brony had already left before Sampo takes us back up to unfuck the situation. There, we find out that we're wanted criminals, so naturally, we go meet the sister of the commander of the Silver Main Guards. I mean, she's hot, so I can't complain, but anyways. Turns out, she's an old buddy of Kokolia, and she knew something fishy was happening with her. Also, 
She kicked her out of her job, and now she's stuck playing guitar instead of being a person with an actual job. She offers to help us, and we accept her help. She takes us through the Silver Main encampments because apparently all the guards there are blind and can't tell that we're the people on the wanted posters. Until a guy who has a crush on Serval sniffs us out. We beast his ass, take his wallet, then finally gain access to the Fragmentium Zone where Cocolia and Bronia apparently ended up. Except, well, Giga Brain, duty bound guitar case fighter over here, won't listen to his older sister and stands in our way. Proto Arthur tries it, so we hold him in place as Serval spanks him for being a naughty child. Then she stays behind to tend to his swollen butt. We go through the Fragmentium. Fragmentium? Fragmentium? Something like that. Question reality on how the fuck Celia isn't freezing to death since he's not a red laser like us. Then we reach Bronia and Cocodia. So his voice reminds Bronia of the butt slap she received earlier. And she snaps out of it and rejects Kokolia's advances of succeeding her as the Celeron's bitch. So, Kokolia says fuck it, this is a Honkai game, and transforms into the Hersher of Ice. Fights breaks out, we get our asses handed to us. And in true anime fashion, God speaks to the player character and gives them a power up to defeat the big bad. You also get to yank control of a giant's mecha on Kokolia and use it to kindly ask her to stop being a bitch. Small cool cutscene plays, Kokolia smiles and fucking evaporates, we take the Celeron. GG, easy. We catch our breath, and then before we could celebrate the badassery we just committed, Bronia has the genius idea of telling us that what happened here stays here, and we can't tell the people what really transpired. I personally told her nah bitch, I'm a hero, I'd like to be recognized as one. Sele called me an idiot, and Bronia dismissed me like I didn't just harness the power of God a few moments ago. Great. So apparently Cocolia died the heroine in the face of a bad Stella Ron. And we were just there watching her fights valiantly and cheering her on from the sidelines. This is the story Bronia came up with as cover so that the citizens don't rebel against the architects and the system. And the system stays cold. Fine. At least everyone's still alive, except Mama Coco. So we go back to the city, speak to Serval, speaks to the Underworlders, and it turns out Natasha was the leader of Wildfire this whole time, and Oleg was just a decoy so that she could test us. Okay. The barrier between the two cities got cleared, and the Underworlders finally get to see the sun for the first time in decades. Lucky for them. I should probably do the same. Anyways, Bronya gives us a speech. Marsh sucks some juice, and we leave the planet after bidding farewell to everyone there. Wow! So, here's the problem. The entire arc was a literal reskin of a side story in Honkai Impact 3rd with extra steps. Kokolia bad? Check. Bronya getting mind fucked by her? Check. Sede and Bronya being from the same orphanage? Check. Natasha owning an orphanage? Check. Take Clara, Serval, Proto Arthur, Pella, Hook, Oleg out of the picture and replace Sampa with a set of stairs and literally nothing would change. We'd still meet Kokolia, we'd still get chased out of the city, we'd still meet Natasha, figure out that Sele and Bronya's connection, beat Svarok's cheeks, and get the info we need, etc. etc. Even Serval's role of being our way into the Silver Main encampment was useless because we had to fight our way through in the end, anyways. This isn't me complaining about the characters, don't get me wrong, I'm simply showing that this whole arc which to my knowledge is considered objectively better than the Shienzo arc, is that it scored just that let me copy your homework meme between Honkai Star Rail and Impact 3rd. The thing that bothers me is that this had so much more potential to be something greater than just ooh Kokolia bad, Bronny and Sela team up to beat her up. Imagine this, during our night in the hotel, we get a message from Kokolia telling us to meet her at the secret spot. Just us, the player character. We go and she's indeed there, alone. She explains that she can hear the voice of the Stellaron and that she knows we can do too. Then explains her POV and why she's doing what she's doing. And asks us to help her with her plan. We explain that we cannot help her with her evil plan, yada yada. And she gives us some time to think about it with the threat that if we reject her offer, she'd have us captured and executed. We go back to the hotel. Tell the gang what happened, contact the Astral Express, and under guidance from above, 
are told to accept the offer in order to locate the Stellaron and get on Kokolia's good side. We do as we're told and we become honorary members of the Silvermane Guards. We go on a couple missions with Bronia, which will allow us to see things from her POV and also cleanse that fragmentium consumed zone of the city instead of forgetting about it for the rest of the story. Then we get cornered by some big monster or something and have to get saved by Sampo. In the underworld, Bronia has no reason to be hostile towards anyone since we were saved by them and she's much closer to the group because we're her group now. Story proceeds as normal, we meet Natasha and Sele, but this time they both recognize Bronia but they're too wary of her to say anything. Shit happens, and at the orphanage when Bronia starts recalling things about her past, Sele finally snaps and berates her for forgetting about her and how they always played together as kids or something. This way, it would make much more sense for them to bond and grow as close friends, rather than the game's excuse that, oh, so we grew in the same orphanage at some point? Guess we're friends now, psych! It would also put Bronia on the right track to start doubting Kokolia's agenda. She starts to suspect that Kokolia messed with her memories or something along those lines. Run things along, Svarog is defeated, reveals the bomb, we as the player nail the final hit on the coffin by telling Bronia what Kokolia told us at the start and show her the letter she sent us to meet her as proof. This way, Bronia is 100% convinced that Kokolia needs to be stopped, not excused. So she asks us to go up with her and help her stop Kokolia. We agree, a night around the bonfire scene would be nice here. Where all the characters gather around and Natasha gets some time with Bronia since she literally lived in her orphanage and she was her caretaker. Something which was never elaborated upon in the original story. The next day, we climb up, ready to show them. We split up, some of us go to get Servo, while the others go with Bronia to recruit some of the silver main guards. Once we're ready, we head towards the Bellabox version of the White House, and surprisingly enough, Kokolia is ready for us. A massive fight breaks out, after which Kokolia escapes as Proto Arthur covers for her because he's a MILF simp. We let Servo spank him and we follow Kokolia. This time, Sele and Bronia can't follow us through the Fragmentium. It's way too cold, they freeze to death. So instead, Sele lends us her scythe, which she explains was given to her as her inheritance from her family when she turned adult, and it's the reason she can teleport around like that. Apparently, it was her dad's trinket and it's a family heirloom yada yada. Give Sele some backstory like that. Bronia, on the other hand, says she has an idea. She climbs up a building and takes out her rifle, puts a scope on that bitch, and says she provides support for outside of Fragmentum. We go in, Kokolia gives a speech on how preservation is dead, and how Stellaron promised her salvation for everyone. Then her boss fights start in the same way, except that this time, instead of God giving us preservation abilities, we use Sele's scythe to teleport around, creating an opening for Bronya to shoot her core and separate her from the Stellaron. While Kokolia lies on the ground unconscious, the Stellaron takes over the massive mecha and uses it to fight us. A strong blow knocks the MC into a nearby ice mountain, and inside we find Shrine to Preservation. Then we get access to the Firelands, and use it to defeat the Mecha before we contain the Stellaron. Upon that, the cold dies down in the area, Sede and Bronia come running, and Bronia cuffs up Kokolia. Kokolia is accused of heresy or something along those lines, and is imprisoned. While Bronia is viewed as the hero who saved Bellabog alongside us. So she becomes the next Supreme Commander, and that was that. I personally believe that adding some more screen time to Kokolia and Bronia before we go down to the underworld, and giving Bronia and Sele a deeper connection, explaining Sele's power, giving Kokolia a valid conclusion other than oops, she dead now, would be much better. But hey, who am I to judge? What do you think? Were you satisfied with the way Bellabog wins? Let me know in the comments section below. With that being said, Thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, please consider pressing the like button and subscribing for more content like this. I am Imaginary Watcher, and I'll see you around.